We don't actually know for sure who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews. Traditionally, it is viewed that Paul was the author, though others say that the disciple Apollos was the author. The interesting tidbit about Hebrews is, of course, the epistle was originally written in the Hebrew language for people of a Jewish background in the church. But we don't have the Hebrew copy. We have only the Greek ancient manuscript, and the oldest ones we have are only in Greek. And there's this interesting puzzle where the theology in Hebrew sounds like something Paul would say, but the vocabulary looks like something Luke would write. So there is a theory that Paul wrote it in the Hebrew language and Luke translated it into Greek. But the importance of the epistle and its existence is that it gives us a summary of everything in the Old Testament that's meaningful, or most meaningful. It gives us a theological overview and clearly written for Hebrew Christians of a Jewish background, but through the ages down to us, it gives us the full explanation of all of those things, the temple, the sacrifices, the Ark of the Covenant, the kingdom period, the kings, the division of prophet, priest, and king, and most importantly, how Jesus is the heart of everything in the Old Testament. Absolutely everything is about Jesus. The exodus, the wandering in the wilderness, the kingdom period, the period of the judges, the fall of the kingdom, the building of the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, all of it. And Hebrews wraps it up nicely in a package that says to those of a Hebrew background, this is how this all works. And says to anyone that wants to understand the Old Testament, here, this is how this works. Of course, they had a temple, and there were sacrifices, and God gave very elaborate rules and regulations for all of these different animals to be sacrificed at different times of years, different animals for different things. There was a graduated sort of income uh, established on it, so the poorer you were, the less you had to sacrifice. It all was very detailed. But then Hebrews tells us very plainly, right at the beginning of this text, the blood of goats and bulls. It is impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to forgive sin. It is impossible for the sacrifices of the Old Testament temple to expiate, forgive, absolve, destroy sin. What? Century after century of everything they did in the temple, everything the priests of God were commanded to do, their vestments, their liturgy, things we inherited and used so much of, all of this in the Old Testament they did around animal sacrifices, and we do it around the Eucharist of our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. But how could all those centuries and all that bloodshed not count for anything because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to expiate sin, to forgive or absolve sin. Sin cannot be blotted out by those sacrifices. Therefore, what is the real meaning of it all? The very first promise of the Christ is in Genesis 3.15, immediately after the fall. God said that a descendant of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, the serpent will wound him, but he will crush the serpent in the end. The Messiah, the Christ. The very first promise is immediately after sin. And it is faith in the promise of God that makes one saved. It is faith in the word of God that makes one absolved of sin. Not anything we do on the outside. It's everything about what exists on the inside. Abraham left everything he knew in Ur to go to a land that God didn't even show him yet because he believed in the Lord. And we're told repeatedly, Abraham believed God and God counted that to him as righteousness. Not that he was morally perfect. Not that he gave all the right sacrifices or did the right good works. But that when God spoke, he believed God. This is the context 
for everything that God has the Israelites do after they emerge from the Exodus. The commands of God and all of those details, they all prophesy things, they point to things, they teach things. The Virgin Mary is foreshadowed by the Ark of the Covenant that God commands his people to build a box, yea, big, and in that he will dwell. He doesn't tell them why. He has them carry the ark with them through the, world, through, the, through the land as they wander. It moves from tribe to tribe until it has a temple. And sometimes God has them carry this ark out on the battlefield and it opens and the energy destroys the enemy. Imagine the gnarling hordes of enemy savages struck down by bolts of lightning from the little box. But it's Jesus in the box because the box is the womb of the Virgin Mary. God is already answering all the critics of the future who will say, you can't put God in a box. All the critics of the future who will say, God can't dwell in a small space. He's infinite, but God can be everywhere at once and anywhere at once that he chooses. God can be in the box, and he has the Israelites carry it around as a reminder. And in another foreshadowing of prophecy, there's an angel on each side of the ark with the wings. And an angel appeared to the Virgin Mary to say, Behold, you will be pregnant. And an angel will appear at the empty tomb when the box is fully empty to say, He is risen, he is not here. The two angels of the Annunciation and the Resurrection are foreshadowed millennia before, literally over a thousand years prior in the commands of God to build the ark. But again, he has them do all of these sacrifices and rituals. He tells them to create these vestments, all of which point to things to come in the future. He has them build the altar, all of which points to things in the future. And all the blood and sacrifice of animals, the giving of the first fruits, none of it forgives sin. None of it, Paul tells us, or the author of Hebrews reminds us. The blood of goats and bulls cannot expiate sin. So what in the world is it about? It can only be about faith. In faith, God tells them to give the first fruits of everything. Their herds and their flocks, their grain. They bring everything they produce, the very top 10% off the top, they bring it to God as an act of faith. God who needs nothing doesn't need it. The burning of the sacrifice, the killing of the animals, is really only happenstance. You kill the animal because in doing so, you can never use it again. It's dead. You burn what's remained because you won't even eat it. What is left is gone. The priests will get it, but that's a footnote of the offering. You burn the grain because then nobody can use it again. See, it's, the, it's offered to God in a way that he does not need to receive it, but we need to make it unusable to us to say we have given it to the Lord. We are not now going to sneak it back home with us and pretend that we offer it. The destruction of the animal didn't expiate sin at all that you came in faith and made your offering saying, Lord, I confess that I am a sinner and by which I make the offering that you command. Doing the good deed of making your offering didn't get you forgiveness because you already had faith which bestowed forgiveness. You made the offering. It's the same in the days of Ahaz. Ahaz is one of my favorite Old Testament kings because he's such a miserable wretch. He's a terrible idolater, evil, conspiring against God's prophets. He's a horrible, horrible man. I like him. He's sort of amusing. This is a good example of this text. Despite everything Ahaz has done, God sends the prophet to him saying, look, you will not be defeated by your enemy. The enemy is coming against you and you're quaking in your boots, but God is still going to give you the victory despite the fact that you're a miserable wretch. Just ask for a sign and he will give it to prove it. 
And of course, Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord my God to the test. Sudden attack of false piety. He doesn't believe in the Lord. He's a good old-fashioned pagan. Sure, he thinks the God of Israel is real. He thinks all those other gods are real too. He doesn't feel any particular compulsion to not offend the God of Israel. That's never bothered him up till now. He's a good classic unbeliever. He's scared to death that God will give him a sign. Because if God gives him a sign, he'll have to believe that God is the only God and that God keeps his promises. He'll go out on that battlefield and win that victory knowing that he owes it to the Lord God and no one else. He'll defeat the hordes of pagan idolaters because God was on his side. He'll have to change his way of thinking, change his way of doing, change his way of life. He doesn't want the sign. So the attack of pretend piety, I will not ask. And it's to this guy, this miserable wretch, that God gives that sign. The virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And poor Ahaz will go out and crush the forces of his enemy because God is on his side. But he won't live long enough to see a virgin give birth. You see, he'll never see the sign manifested but he'll still have to know that it's coming because his victory proves that it's coming, his victory against all odds. He has to go to his grave with that fear of should I repent, and we don't know whether he did or not. Only God knows to the deathbed. Ahaz doesn't want to know, but the sign is still given. See, Ahaz is an ancestor of Jesus Christ. He's of the line of David and a king, a rightful king of Israel, king of Judah. He gets to be part of that lineage despite everything that he's done. And he gets to have that promise announced to him despite everything that he's done. And again, everything comes down to faith or not faith, not in the outward act. Ahaz knows that. He's smart enough to figure that out. If there's proof that God is real, then he's going to have to change what he does. Therefore, what we do says what we believe about God, and this is how good works and faith play out. The goats and bulls sacrificed in the temple did not expiate sin by their death. The sin was expiated because the repentant believers who came to offer the first fruits believed the word of the Lord, did it, and therefore it was counted to them as righteousness. Their doing was a natural consequence of their believing, and therefore it is by faith that they are saved. This is the message of the gospel, and it is the message of everything in the Old Testament. Every time the chips are down, it's faith that draws the distinction. God goes on and on in the books of the prophets against the Israelites because of their wickedness and unbelief. He says, your sacrifices are offensive to me. I can't stand the stink of your burnt offerings. He keeps telling them to stop burning incense and doing the liturgy. He says, get out of my house and stop doing this farce. He's offended by it because they don't believe in him or they believe that he's one God among many or they figure they might as well hedge their bets because great-great-grandpa Saul believed this stuff. Whatever, they're hedging their bets, and God says, go away. I don't want you hedging your bets. I don't want to be one God among many. I don't want your lies and your falsehood because the sacrifices were a creed and a confession of what one believed. Without faith, they were meaningless. You could sacrifice all the goats and bulls in the world, and God did not care if these were not offered in faith. In fact, in that instance, he'd say, that's bad stewardship. They're going to go extinct. The sacrifices themselves do not expiate sin. But this is what's key. Why is it so important? First, offering it, as I said, it's destroyed, so we can no longer use it. If you sneak some home, God knows, and he knows you weren't sincere. We offer it in a way that it is no longer used for us. But the blood of goats and bulls and pigeons and thousands of other things and millions of creatures 
over the period of time that would have been sacrificed in the temple to the Lord. All of it points to the blood of Jesus Christ. It points in a prophetic way. It's the reminder that no matter how many times you offered the sacrifice in the temple, you had to come back because you were still a sinner and your sins were not really gone for good. You keep coming back and you do it over and over and over and over again, but that blood does not take it away fully. The blood of Jesus Christ is that which takes away sin fully and also repeatedly. In both ways, Jesus fulfills the promise of the Old Testament, of everything they did, of the vestments and the liturgy and the incense and the sacrifice and the rituals and the ark and the angels on the ark. Everything comes to fruition in the angel that announces the annunciation and the angel at the empty tomb to Jesus being in the womb of the Virgin Mary, the one from whom lightning will come out to strike down the wicked at the judgment day. He did it to the Philistines from the ark, and he reaches out from the womb of Mary, becoming an adult, a risen and glorified, still human and God, who will strike down the wicked with lightning bolts out of him again. It comes to completion, everything that was offered, done, prayed, hoped for, yearned for, and taught, in the Old Testament comes to fruition in Jesus. His is the blood that does expiate sin because finally the one thing that sin definitely requires of all of us, which is our death for our sin and our damnation for our sin, Jesus gets to be that for us. He gets to know what separation from his Father is like. He gets to die and be put in the tomb in our place. So that now our tomb is a temporary holding area and not a permanent one. He who made the temporary sacrifices permanent makes our permanent death temporary. He fulfills it all, coming, being born into the world to die for the sins of the world, and how fitting that the Annunciation almost always falls in Lent when we prepare for the crucifixion and death of our Lord, to be reminded of the nativity, that the baby that we cherish, all the beautiful romanticized images of the Christ child, he comes into the world in blood, in childbirth, in pain, and in weeping, because he will leave the world the same way. It is the purpose for which the baby comes. It is the purpose for which he goes to the cross for us. It is the purpose for which he comes again, even to set us free of sin forever, doing what none of those other things could do, giving us the gift that comes from faith, even this, that we receive this body and blood over and over again now, the true blood for the true sacrifice, the true expiation of our sins. It does forgive. It does restore it does give eternal life. It is the fulfillment of that which was foreshadowed. In Jesus' name, amen.